Hi, my name is Jesse Quack, and I am the editor of the Crooked series of sci-fi crime anthologies. I'll tell you a little bit more about the anthologies at the end, but first I want to present a reading um, from Mark Teppo, reading from volume two of the anthology. Um, this is originally recorded October 26th. Mark Teppo divides his time between Portland and Sumner, and he tends to navigate by local bookstore positioning. He writes historical fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction, and horror, and has published more than a dozen novels. If he's writing a mystery, he's pretending to be Harry Bryant. He also runs Underland Press, an independent publishing house. Right, go ahead, Mark. So yes, I'll be reading from the uh, Western Oblique Job. And as you see, we have a picture here of uh, uh, Lale Leo Tamora, the uh, Managed Employee of the Month, who is the uh, main character of this story. And uh, we will jump right in and see what's going on with him. <clears throat> La Le Leo Tamora was daydreaming about a stay vacation in a private high flyer suite on Particulate Chalice, that fancy resort station thwack in the middle of the Hydrangea Nebula. Stacked with a week's worth of food and entertainment and a fully stocked wet bar, of course, no windows, no access to the local network either, keep the distractions to a minimum. The suite didn't have to be big, he wasn't asking for much, but two rooms at least, one of which would have a, have a tub. He wouldn't fill it with water. That was a completely unnecessary extravagance but he would sleep in it all by himself. One week, seven days, 200 and a convict. Leo snapped out of his fantasy and the steam filled bathroom of the high flyer suite vanished. He squinted in the hard glare of the desert sun. The man interrupting his daydreaming wore the uniformly ugly gray of the Caplodonic Extraction Company. He had a narrow face and a flat nose, the sort of face a mother would love until the epidural wore off. If the company had a dental plan, this guy was not taking advantage of it. Dreaming about pussy? The man asked, grinning at Leo's disorientation. Once upon a time, Leo would have responded with a crass comment about the man's mother, or even his sister, but somewhere in the last 864 days, Leo had lost interest in that sort of insouciance. A pity, really, because the ladies had always liked his devil-may-care attitude towards bullies, tough guys, and all-around assholes. However, Leo was on a steady diet of assholes these days, and there were, how many? 2,984 more days of this bullshit to go. Ah, yeah, Leo sighed. I may have been. The company man, whose name was Pierre Tree, and who not so secretly harbored a real kick in the nuts animosity towards those who had traveled more than a light year in their lifetime, grinned at Leo. Oh, man, those teeth were bad. You ain't getting none of that today, he chortled. Nor tomorrow, or tomorrow, or the day after, Leo thought. He rolled his tongue into his cheek, considering a response. Maybe it was the hard light of the landscape that was making him feel a little starchy, or maybe it was the monotony of this... Uh, he didn't really, didn't really want to have to call it a relationship, but what other word was there? Get back to work, Pierre Tree snarled, or I'll get someone to discipline you. Leo's work, if you could call sitting on your ass and staring at drone monitors work, was to watch the obsolete by any standards flyers float over the endless hotness of the Fanny Lou Wastes, a couple hundred thousand square kilometers of rock and sand that ran from the barrier wall to the endless escarpment. Caplodonic, as far as the trade houses and ensolage were concerned, was a mining subsidiary of House Quince. They, they were on Glossalia 4, scouting for deep chart metals, the sort of materials used in long-range sensor arrays or next-generation fusion drives, or like Leo didn't know, didn't really care either. What he and 300 other bunkers knew was that Caplodonic Extraction Company was a black site work farm. A prison, if you wanted to be gauche about it. Now, it's expressly noted in IECA, the Interstellar Exploration and Commerce Accords, that the individual has an inherent and unassailable sovereignty over themselves. Subsequent lines in the Accords go on and on and on about the definitions of sovereignty and individual, laying out in very precise terms how and why a trade house must honor and respect the all-important sanctity of the individual. Naturally, a lot of these subsections complicate the efficiency of cleaning up loose ends that is capital punishment. And most houses had to resort to more economic, and morally acceptable solutions when it came to dealing with criminals, which is to say you worked off your debt to society the old fashioned way. In Leo's case, a term of 10 galactic standard years, three for trafficking in illegal goods, three for traveling under forged documents, and four for carrying unlicensed arms and armament within House Quince's jurisdiction. In a word, Leo had been smuggling contraband. Good shit, too. It hadn't been the first time, and should he survive the next 2,984 days, not that he was counting, Leo suspected he would probably commit these same crimes again in Quint's controlled space. He knew this about himself. He had a, habit of, had a habit of picking up things that weren't his. Anyway, the tech running the drones was old wire mill spec, stuff already ancient when Leo took his first fealty oath to a free company. 
His youthful enthusiasm aside, he had been the shortest one in his battalion, which meant he got picked last and stayed at the depot more often than not. Leo had a choice, let his size control his career or actually do something with the talents he had. And so, while the rest of the muscle-bound, testosterone friendly fucknuts of the Liberty Security Fraternity were suiting up and dropping down on some backwater planet and terrorizing the locals, Leo went about mastering the company's support infrastructure. He learned how to fly the drones. He reverse engineered all the comms. He became a god at rewiring the rigs when their circuit boards flashed or got tiny biters into the semi semicircle networks. And he pulled machine intelligences back from the brink when they lost themselves in self-referential logic traps. He made himself indispensable. And when all the mercenary companies were outlawed after the atrocities committed by the Armored Security Legion in the Mari Maricolasa insurrection, Leo's skill made him a useful bunker. And when he got goosed in one of the House Quince's interplanetary security agency dragnets, his debt was quickly bought out by Capladonic, and he was shipped to the sandiest and emptiest planet in the entire galactic arm. Where, proving the old axiom that the universe forgets nothing, especially your past mistakes, Leo found himself in charge of a bunch of tech that looked like it had fallen off an old ASL dreadnought, which it probably had. A lot of the Legion's hardware had quickly disappeared when House Mary, Col Mary Coley was still wailing on about the atrocities committed by the Fists, and it didn't take much computational power to guess at the color of the mood boards in Quora's council chambers, and since it was a crime to possess this tech, obviously you needed a criminal to support it. So, the goal of today's excursion, by the way, was mapping the gullies and ravines of the western oblique boulange, an 80-kilometer-long upthrust of granite and basalt that rippled along the ragged spire of the wastes, an angry shard of a mountain in the making. There were lots of crevices and cracks along the oblique, and KEC was eager to get the topographical mapping done so they could sink some crust busters and bring up whatever precious metals and minerals that were hiding beneath the sand. Look, if House Quince couldn't dissolve individuals it was displeased with, then they were going to get in some useful work out of them. KEC wasn't doing charity work here. Like every other subsidiary, it had to show profit somehow. Leo and PRG were in a Ganesh Industries infantry trawler, an eight-wheeled ground hugger of a transport designed to move men and machines from one location to another as efficiently and as uncomfortably as possible. A half dozen muscle tufts glowered from hard seats. Leo wasn't sure why management had insisted on so many watchdogs. It wasn't like he was going to hop out of the trawler and make a break for the wall, and mostly he ignored them because he had screens to watch. Leo had four drones in the air. Two were doing high altitude scans of the oblique, building the general topo model, and the other two were crawling the extensive maze of crannies that cover the rocky upthrust. A clock on one of the screens said they had been at it for six hours, and the drones had another three or four hours of battery power before they had to come back to the trawler to recharge. And it would take them another two to rumble back to Rover Baco, an old mining facility that Capladonic had taken over as their base of operations. All told, that would be a day's work such as it was, which meant Leo's debt would be reduced by one when they returned to base. Look, you marked your victories, no matter how small. One of the high-flying drones pinged an atmospheric anomaly alert on his slate, and Leo absentmindedly went to tag it as one of the infrequent sightings they had of the indigenous predators that surfed the thermals over the Thanalu wastes. He hesitated when he glanced at the visual profile on the screen. It was long and thin, not at all like the disks the software used to represent the flyers. He zoomed in on the object, and when he, as he watched, it spawned a small mushroom shape that trailed behind it. And another mushroom blossomed, and Leo realized he was watching a high-altitude drop shoot deploy, deploy. What is that? Pierre Tree, always sensitive to changes in the room, was suddenly standing behind Leo's station. Drop shoot, Leo said. An assault trooper? Gotta say, Leo said, falling into the loose slang of the bunkers, the men and women who did all the important contract work on house trade ships. Are we, are we under attack? Leo could understand the incredulity in Pietri's voice. There was nothing of strategic value in the Thanalu wastes. The nearest landmark visible from space was the Higora Spire, a mile-high barrier of slag and stone, but it was more than 200 kilometers south of their current location. If some agency was dropping soldiers on the oblique, they were operating under really bad intelligence. Unless, of course, they had really good intelligence, Leo thought, reflecting on the other, other thing that Capladonic was doing on Gloacia 4. Even then, he thought, why would they be dropping a spotter here and not closer, closer to Rover, Rover Baco? Leo checked the data feed from the other high flyer drone. Just the one, he said, nothing else in the Atmo. Leo and Pierre Tree watched the tiny shape twist beneath the half moon of the drop chute. The drone's resolution was grainy, but it was clear that then an actual person was flying that chute. They're heading for us, Leo realized. Pierre Tree swore. He started yelling at the rover muscle, using words like imminent and assault and sky bandits. 
Leo doubted Pietri's assessment, but he understood the threat level he was shoving at the muscle. It was the sort of message fucknuts understood, and by the time the falling angel had landed, the team of security goons were armored and andoed, ammoed. They surged out of the trawler in a fashion that wasn't entirely embarrassing, and all their guns were pointed in the right direction. Which seemed like an awful lot of overkill for the narrow shoulder, suggestively clad leather, sorry, narrow shoulder, suggestively curved, leather clad figure, but hey, an anomaly was an anomaly. No one ever congratulated you for being under, for underreacting. And the figure raised her hands to show she wasn't carrying any armament. The comm speaker in the cabin of the trawler crackled as she reached out. Hello, boys. This display of heavy weaponry is very flattering. Pietri stabbed a button on his console with more force than necessary. Who are you? He demanded. What are you doing here? I was hoping to talk to someone in charge. I doubt that's you, but maybe you could give me a lift. You are trestling passing on Capladonic. The woman did a thing with her fingers, and a blinking logo slammed Leo's slate. Six stars and interlocking triangles. It was Ancelage's Ministry of Accordance, Recompense, and Solidarity. The group called in when diplomatic language and economic sanctions weren't getting the job done. In the cabin, Leo was the only one who heard Pierre Tree's heart, heart leap in his chest. That's, you're highly irregular, the trawler boss managed. I know, the woman said. There was a conciliatory tone in her voice but I thought it would be easier if I just cut through the executive thought speech and showed up. Pietri stammered something into the comms and then turned towards Leo. His face was flushed and his eyes were wide and agitated. You should call it in, Leo suggested, trying to be helpful. Get some feedback from management. Maybe even have someone talk to boss man. This way it isn't your fault if... Pietri flapped his hands at Leo. Take her down, he said to the squad of goons with guns. Boss man will want to see our prize. Leo flicked the external trawler cams to the big screen so he could watch what happened next. And why wouldn't he? This was the most excitement he'd had in a very long time. The six KEC troopers approached the leather-clad woman. One of them shouted at her to get down on her knees. She didn't comply. Three of them charged her. There was a minor fracas, which ended up with two of the three incapacitated. The third held the woman down long enough for the remaining troopers to move in. Bring her inside, Pietri told his victorious squad. He gave Leo a gloating smile. And Leo didn't say anything because... To his eye, the whole exchange looked as if it had gone down exactly as the woman had planned. Hey, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that reading. So I promised I'd tell you a little bit more about Crooked, and here we are. Um, so what Crooked is, is a series of sci-fi crime anthologies um, that are edited by me. And the thing that sets this anthology series apart is that it exclusively focuses on including stories that are part of a bigger universe. So if you read one story by an author, say if you really enjoyed what you just heard, you can go to that author's site, um, which will be below in the show notes, and you can read more that set more stories set in that universe. Um, so the idea is to give readers kind of more of what they love and introduce them to other authors. So for example, if you're a big fan of one person's universe and you find, oh, they've got a story in Crooked, you can go read that story and then you might find other stories by similar authors and then you can go read their world. So kind of just a way of helping readers explore and find more authors that they love. And so if you enjoyed what you heard, please go support that author. Follow the links below. Um, you can go buy the anthology and read more stories or listen to more of the presentations of people reading excerpts from their stories on this YouTube channel, go ahead and subscribe there. And uh, yeah, I look forward to bringing you more exciting sci-fi crime stories. Take care there.